gentleness. <laughs> you would think three weeks is probably enough, but uh, you still have two more weeks uh, with me. And so just for those who uh, maybe missed a few weeks, you know, I have been teaching a teaching series that uh, I have titled Gentle and Lonely. And this teaching series is uh, just a compilation of my own personal reflections on uh, my studies here and there on the gentleness of God over the last few years. And as I told you in the first week when we started that my study into the gentleness of God um, really got started when I was confronted by my then fiance, Abby. And when I came to the realization that I wasn't a gentle person, that gentleness was uh, absent from uh, my mind and the way I did things in my life. And what this meant uh, was that if I am not a gentle person, uh, then I ultimately don't believe that God himself is a gentle person. So if I want to become gentle, if I want to become more like what God is like, then I need to come to a better understanding of what God's gentleness actually looks like. And so throughout the last few years, my, own, my studies on the gentleness of God has really transformed who I am today. I am not the same person I was those years ago when um, Abby first told me uh, what I was really like. And so I hope to share with you my own reflections on the gentleness of God uh, for the purpose uh, that it will also transform you as well. And I hope that uh, the time that we have spent together has uh, changed uh, the way that you think about gentleness and about God's gentleness. In week one, we looked at the fact that God is indeed a gentle God. And this ought to uh, you know, make us step back for a moment because our own personal experiences with people tell us that the most powerful people, the people with the highest status, the people with the most amount of money, the most sophisticated people around us uh, don't tend to be gentle. Uh, they tend to be sticklers, uh, picky people. And yet the God of the universe who has all power, who has the highest amount of authority, who has the greatest amount of status, who is the most sophisticated of them all, is gentle. And you wouldn't think that that would be the case. And so if your theology is based off of your own experience, gentleness is not something you would attribute to God. So how do we know that God is gentle? In week one, we saw that God is gentle because God says that he is gentle. He said so about himself when he said, I am gentle and lowly at heart in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And what Jesus means by this is that gentleness is not merely what he does, what he exercises it is who he is. His actions are motivated by the gentleness that is in his own heart. We saw also that gentleness has a direction. It leads Jesus to provide spiritual rest for weary, heavy laden people. This suggests that gentleness is concerned about restlessness. Its aim is to provide rest to restless people. We also saw that Jesus' gentleness is available to all people who are weary and heavy laden in this life. And that includes you and me as a description of every single person on earth. And all we need to do to access God's gentleness is to simply come to him. To come to him and to take for ourselves his yoke, his burden that he describes as being easy and light. And how does Jesus provide us this rest? How does his gentleness give us rest? Through his redemptive work in his life, death, and resurrection. 
And so this means then that everything that Jesus did in his life, everything that he accomplished in his death, everything that he's doing now is motivated by his gentleness. So if you want to see God's gentleness, we only need to look at what Jesus has said, what he has done for weary, heavy laden people who have come to him. And in week two, we saw that some of the most weary and heavy laden people who came to Jesus throughout his ministry were people with physical ailments, people with illnesses and people with diseases. And God's desire to provide spiritual rest to his people is manifested in his ministry, in his provision to provide physical rest for his people from their physical illnesses. What does this mean? It means that Jesus' healings of people from their illnesses, from their diseases, from their ailments are prime examples of God's gentleness in action. They show us what God's gentleness looks like. And so in week two, we looked at what God's gentleness looks like in the healing of the leper in Matthew chapter eight, verses three to four. And there we saw that we learned that gentleness is motivated by genuine desire for the other person. Remember that when the leper asked Jesus if he desired to make him clean, what did Jesus say? He said, I will. I want it for you. I long to make you better. You also learn that gentleness often requires us to lower ourselves to being or doing things that are beneath us. This is something that is typically harder for those of us who think of ourselves as sophisticated. It's something that is often harder for those of us that lead busy lives, harder for those of us that may be wealthier have higher positions in our culture. And so even though the man that had leprosy was unclean and Jesus himself was clean, Jesus went out of his way to stretch out his hand in front of everybody to touch the man, to heal him. And he could have healed him at a distance, but instead he physically touched him. He stooped down to the level of the man who had leprosy. The God who has no illness was willing to touch a man with an illness. Lastly, we also saw that gentleness engages in substitution. It means taking upon ourselves the burdens of others and having others benefit from our own work. And this is exactly how Jesus is able to make the leper clean. By taking the leper's uncleanliness upon himself and giving to the leper Jesus' own cleanliness. So this is an ultimate example of God's gentleness. It's Jesus' own, own substitutionary work in our redemption. In week three, we looked at what God's gentleness looks like in another person that had an ailment, in a man who was paralyzed. And there we saw that God's gentleness is always available, always available to those who come to him in faith. We saw there that Jesus recognized the faith of the paralyzed man. He was a man that didn't care what the optics looked like. He knew that if he simply came to Jesus, even if he came through him, to him through the hole in a roof, that he would not be turned away for his faith. We also saw that God's gentleness addresses the real heart of the matter. It addresses the real reason why we're restless. God's gentleness addresses our sins, not merely the circumstances of our sins. Even though Jesus saw that the man was paralyzed, he was a man coming down a roof. What, a, what would have been most apparent to us was his paralysis, but what was most apparent to Jesus was his sin. And he first forgave him of his sin before he healed him of his paralysis. Lastly, we saw there the healing of the paralytic that God's gentleness leads him to forgive us of our sins, to no longer hold our sins against us. And this is 
how he is able to heal the man of his physical paralysis by healing the man of his sinful spiritual paralysis. And so Jesus' willingness then to forgive sins is a deep example of the depth of his gentleness. And what I want us to have learned so far is that gentleness is more than how we talk or how we respond to a person or how we react to a circumstance. I think this is the way that we think of gentleness. We think of gentleness in kind of these superficial communicative ways. But here in the scriptures, you see that gentleness plays a more critical role than you think. Gentleness was at the very heart of God's motivation to redeem his people. And so as people that have come to Jesus for rest, we ourselves have experienced firsthand God's gentleness. Have you thought about that for a moment? You as a believer, as a child of God, has already experienced the gentleness of God, expressed in his deepest form in his adoption of you into his kingdom, into his family. And so having experience God's gentleness for ourselves, we should let it transform us. We should let it change us. It's not merely enough to know what God's gentleness looks like. We must let God's gentleness change us. Change us and guide us in how we live in our every day-to-day -day life. And so this week and next week, I want to talk to you about how God's gentleness transforms us. And in particular, I want us to look at how God's gentleness transforms two types of people. People like me, <laughs> people who struggle to exercise gentleness towards others. But not only does God's gentleness transforms people like me, God's gentleness also transforms those who struggle with not receiving gentleness from others, not experiencing gentleness from their spouse, their employer, or their children. Gentleness is not only for people that struggle to be gentle. Gentleness is also for people who wish they had more gentleness in their lives. Today, I want us to talk about how God's gentleness transforms the first person those of us who struggle to exercise gentleness. And how does God's gentleness transform us for people like us? In particular, I want us to see how God's gentleness transforms our anger, our anger. I think that most people that struggle to be gentle really have a struggle with tempering our anger. And that is understandably so. Uh, when we have been hurt, for example, maybe we have been betrayed. Uh, maybe you have had something stolen from you. Maybe you have been lied to by your own children or your spouse. Maybe you have been gossiped about or slandered, or maybe you've even been bullied in school. When we have been hurt, it is natural of us, sinfully natural to begin to hold on to our anger, to cling to our anger. It's almost as if our anger is a, 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 a place of safety or refuge. And so when we cling to our anger, we begin to wish ill will on the offending party, the friend, the spouse, the child, the employer, the coworker. We want to start playing fire with fire. We want to exempt ourselves from God's command for us to give a gentle answer. And what clinging to our anger does is clinging to our anger gives us a false sense of power. Right? It's, a, it's a way of us being able to lord something over the offending, offending, part, offending party. It soothes us into thinking that we are in control when actually anger slowly destroys us. Uh, one person once said that 
Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything into which it is poured. Yeah, kind of poetic. Another uh, person, uh, an author, Anne Lameau, said that nursing a grudge against someone is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. So when we cling to our anger, we risk our anger destroying our lives. <clears throat> but to not cling to our anger doesn't mean that we are not allowed uh, to be angry at all. Uh, a number of years ago, I mean, those of you who know me know that I'm a very routine person. Every morning I wake up and I read articles, typically opinions about day-to-day -day matters. I spend maybe about 20 to 30 minutes while, while I'm drinking coffee. And a number of years ago, I read an article about an uh, elementary school pamphlet, a little a printout. And it was being passed out to students at this particular elementary school uh, during the height of the, uh, the bullying movement. I think the bullying movement came maybe before the, the Me Too movement and where bullying was on the news quite often. And this elementary school was passing out pamphlets, teaching students how to respond uh, to hurt, uh, to bullying. And uh, there were nine rules uh, that uh, they were teaching these uh, children. Let me read to you these nine rules, okay? Rule number one, refuse to get mad. Okay. Rule number two, treat the person that is being mean to you as if they are trying to help you. Number three, do not be afraid. Number four, do not verbally defend yourself. Number five, do not attack. Number six, if someone physically hurts you, do not get angry. Number seven, do not tell on bullies. Number eight, don't be a sore loser. And lastly, number nine, learn to laugh at yourself. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but uh, something seems off about these rules. Uh, these don't seem like uh, good rules for teaching children how to respond to hurt or to bullying. It actually seems like these kinds of rules might actually encourage more bullying. And so we intuitively know that something is off about these rules. Right? This elementary school was trying to uh, go the opposite way, uh, to take the anger of the bully and say to the person who's being bullied, don't be angry yourself. And so this article was actually titled, U.S. School Provides Worst Bullying Advice Ever. <laughs> that was the title of the, uh, the article that I read. But there is a kind of anger that God not only allows, but also commands us to have. Um, let me read to you Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. So here in Psalm chapter four, verse four, we're told to be angry, but to not sin. And this is echoed again in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter four, verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So there is a kind of anger that God allows and expects us to have but without sin. And when I think of a person that uh, had a lot of anger, but did not respond with sin, um, I think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he had many faults. I've have read many works of Martin Luther King Jr. I highly critical of the man, but in regards to his work in the civil rights movement, he responded rightly. And I want us to get an idea of what, of how much anger he really had. Um, I wanna to read to you a portion of his letter to the Birmingham, Birmingham uh, jail. Um, let me see here, let me find it.
And there's some strong language here. So I've warned about that ahead of time. Here's what Martin Luther King Jr. says. And he was writing this letter to uh, white ministers, um, believe it or not, that kept telling him in private that they were in support of him, but in public did nothing. And this is what his response to them. He says, perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-county drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in an uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Dr. King was rightfully angry about the plight of African-Americans, not just not that many years ago. But in his anger, he responded rightly. Uh, and this is why he was given the Nobel Prize later in 1964. And let me read to you what he says in his speech, his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize. I conclude that this award which I receive on behalf of that movement is a profound recognition that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral question of our time. The need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. If this is to be achieved, man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. The Bible teaches us that it is possible to be angry and also loving at the same time, to be furious and gracious at the same time, to be strong and to also be gentle. And what this suggests is that to be angry and to not sin right, is to be both at the same time, where our anger is motivated by our gentleness. And this kind of anger resists the impulse to strike back. And it leaves the execution of justice to God. And this is something Dr. King understood. And yet this same kind of anger can also be harnessed to destroy what is evil, what is sinful and to protect what is good. You see, when Jesus got angry, it was tempered by his gentleness. 
And there are many examples of Jesus's anger. Let me give you a few of those examples. Uh, he flipped a number of tables in the temple, for example, uh, letting people's coins and monies uh, drop on the ground all over the place. He name called people, right? You wouldn't think that uh, <clears throat> Jesus uh, would ever uh, resort to name calling, but he did. He called people hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, children of the devil. He even called Peter Satan at one point. But when Jesus got angry, it doesn't mean that his love went out the window. But rather, Jesus was both angry and both loving at the same time. And so how do we have the kind of anger that Jesus had, right? How do we temper our anger? How do we let our anger be motivated by our gentleness? And here's, here, here's the way that I want us to think about it. It's helpful to think of anger not as the opposite of love, okay? Anger is not the opposite of love. Anger is the product of love. Follow me now. Anger is not the opposite of love. Anger is the product of love. So what we get angry most about, right? whatever we get angry about the most, reveals what? It reveals what we love most. This is alluded, this principle is alluded to by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. He says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, semicolon, hold fast to what is good. And this principle is true for all kinds of anger, whether good or bad, whether quick or slow. All anger is the result of what you really love deep down inside. <clears throat> so this means that if you and I struggle with gentleness, if you and I are quick to get angry, consider what you get angry about. What does it reveal about what you love? If we want to temper our anger, if we want to have our gentleness direct our anger, we need to change what we love. There's a good author named uh, uh, Rebecca Pippert. And she said that true love detests whatever destroys what we love. We have a, you know, we have a sense that uh, uh, this is true. If, uh, if, uh, if a mom tells a child uh, learning how to walk in the public streets for the first time, you know, you don't uh, run into the street. Right? You have to look both ways before you run into the street. But if that child runs into the street out of nowhere, what do you think the mom is going to do? The mom is going to scream. The mom is going to yell. Uh, the mom is going to get angry, but she doesn't get angry because uh, she doesn't love her daughter. She gets angry because she loves her daughter and has to make it apparent that you don't run out onto the street. Or if you have a son that is uh, destroying himself, drinking, smoking uh, all the time. Parents will do everything they can to prevent their son from making those bad choices. Not because they are opposed to the son, but because they are opposed to the son's bad behavior. So anger is not the opposite of love. It is the product of love. What your anger looks like, what you get angry about, what makes you quick to anger, reveals what your love looks like. So we cannot buy into the idea that as a Christian, we can never be angry. Scripture doesn't uh, support this position. In fact, if you were to look at the prayers of Old Testament Christians, throughout the Old Testament. There are many examples of uh, uh, anger among God's people. 
you can read even the uh, imprecatory psalms, for example, and find that there is plenty of anger. So it is possible to be angry and not sin. How do we do that? By hating what is evil, like what Paul says, and to cling to what is good. By changing what we love, we're able to change what we get angry about. Not only is there good anger, that God commands us to be angry for, there's also bad anger. It's a kind of anger that is, we are most familiar with. <laughs> We're most familiar with uh, a sinful kind of anger. We're not the most familiar with a righteous anger. And this is an anger that is motivated by sin. We see this in, this is a type of anger that is written about in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 9, of uh, chapter 29, verse 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit. But a wise man quietly holds back. Sinful anger is also uh, spoken of in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. This kind of anger, this sinful anger that is motivated by love for sinful things, <clears throat> reveals a heart on full display. This is the kind of anger that results in malice, the kind of anger that results in slander, obscene talk, manipulation, control, hatred. This is what this kind of anger looks like. Jesus tells us that this kind of anger will be met with judgment. He says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gifts. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. So this is not the kind of anger that we want to have in our life. This kind of anger is not motivated by love for the things that God loves. This kind of anger is motivated by our love to destroy and to diminish people's lives. We can compare this kind of, you know, toxic anger to a fire. We know that a fire can be very good. It has very useful qualities. It keeps us warm. It helps us cook. And anger in the Lord can have those same useful qualities. But when you make a fire and you don't set boundaries around that fire, if you're not responsible around that fire, it will spread and will consume anything and everything around it. I just had a fire earlier this week, um, not too far away from here, from Irvine. And anger is the same way. If there are no boundaries placed around your anger, it will consume your life. And it will consume the people around you. So I want to, I want to give you some practical advice. If you are quick to anger, how do we express our anger within godly boundaries. And we could take a pointer from Jesus, some practical advice. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, this is what Jesus says. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. Jesus gives us some practical advice here about how we can manage our anger, how we can temper our anger with God's love and God's gentleness. And it starts with being faithful in the things that are little so that we can be faithful in the things that are much. Uh, think about uh, your pet peeves, for example, as uh, ways of tempering your anger. Let me share with you <clears throat> my, uh, some of my pet peeves, okay? 
Well, I have many of them. So maybe we'll, we'll extend this another half hour, yeah? <laughs> uh, uh, the biggest pet peeve I have, ready? I have a pet peeve for sloppiness. I have a deep-seated pet peeve for sloppiness. And it can be um, with anything. It can be with cooking. It can be with food. It can be with your shoes, uh, the wrinkles on your shirt. It could be anything. Uh, the way an event is set up, anything. Um, so this pet peeve of mine uh, comes to me every hour of the day because there's nothing which I cannot identify sloppiness in. Um, so I view being late as a form of uh, sloppiness uh, that's not worth respecting. For example, I remember um, the uh, wedding planner for my wedding. She came up to me on the day of the wedding and she asked me, she said, oh, you know, uh, I uh, just want to ask you if <clears throat> you would like to start the wedding a little bit later, um, just to make sure that the guests can get on time. And I remember looking back, saying to her, oh, if the guests cannot be on time, then they don't need to be guests. And I just walked away. <laughs> so that's my kind of view on uh, lateness and sloppiness. And uh, I have a pet peeve for having low standards for day-to-day -day living. Um, I don't like it when things are not done well for yourself. But these pet peeves are little forms of anger. They're little irritants that can set us off and they can accumulate. And we may not know it, but when we have these little pet peeves, people around us know what our pet peeves are and they have to walk on eggshells around us. Right? Um, so people around me who know me very well have to walk on eggshells regarding whether or not they're doing something sloppily or the outcome of something is sloppy. But consider whatever pet peeves you have and consider them as gifts to you, to me, for the formation of our character. That when we have small, minor irritants in our lives, um, they force us frequently, right? Often uh, throughout all times of day to make tiny little decisions to cooperate with gentleness. And we may, not, we may not think much about these tiny little decisions, but as we practice right, gentleness, as we practice tempering our anger with these small irritants, consider the cumulative effects. It grows as we do it more often, as we do it um, more frequently, it grows our ability to be gentle. This is why Jesus is able to say, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. But if you are not able to be faithful in little, you cannot be faithful in much. So what this means then is that our faithfulness in little cultivates our faithfulness in much. So how do you learn how to tell the truth under pressure? You tell the truth all the time. You don't tell white lies, you don't exaggerate, you say things as they are. How do you learn how to be generous when you are rich? You learn how to be generous when you are poor. How do we learn how uh, uh, to not be offended by large offenses? We learn how to be not offended by small offenses. Consider what God said to Cain when Cain was harboring resentment against Abel. God says to him in Genesis chapter four, verse seven, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. We don't think of these tiny irritants as things crouching at the door of our hearts waiting for us to exert our anger, but they are. And as we learn how to overcome, control our anger, exercise gentleness in the very small things of our lives, we grow 
to be able to exercise gentleness to the large problems and circumstances and offenses in our lives. So we have to live in such a way that anger is crouching at our door. We must be aware of it, ready to rule over it. John Owen, a Puritan preacher said, you must kill sin or sin will kill you. And there is a lot at stake here. Right? Consider that when we don't exercise gentleness in our anger, when we don't temper our anger, there is a lot at stake. When anger controls your life, and some of us know the kinds of people that are completely controlled by anger, it destroys your life and it destroys your relationships. Nobody wants to be around you at all. So if you struggle with gentleness like I have struggled with gentleness, I wanna ask you to consider uh, to practice. <laughs> That's my practical advice to you, to simply practice with the small things. <laughs> consider those pet peeves that you have and learn how to maybe ignore them or let it go. As you practice that more often throughout your day-to-day -day life, you will begin to see, you'll begin to grow in your gentleness. It's almost like going to the gym and working out. Well, under COVID-19, the gyms are closed or most of them are closed. When you go for the first time, maybe you can only lift a two and a half pound dumbbell, right? You wanna do a bicep curl. Uh, all the bigger guys are doing 25 pounds. And a scrawny little guy like you, you go in there, you can only do two and a half pounds, right? But if you go back day to day every week and rest and keep at it, eventually you'll be able to lift 25 pounds. And I want us to think of our anger as that. If you want to overcome your anger, you struggle with tempering your anger, start small, start small. And you have to start somewhere. And when you start small and practice, you'll grow, it's like a muscle. And eventually you'll be able to exercise gentleness with even the deepest of offenses. Now, some of you may be thinking in the back of your mind, okay, Stephen, you're talking to me about irritants, small minor irritants, but what about true injustice? Real evil, the kind of injustice that Martin Luther King Jr. and many African-Americans experienced at that time and still continue to experience today. What are we supposed to do about that? Are we supposed to roll over like we're some dog? No, that's not the case. The Bible uh, teaches us to pursue justice, uh, to pursue it diligently. If you recall, Jesus uh, told a parable in uh, Luke chapter 18 about the parable of the persistent widow. Let me, let me read to you as a reminder of what this parable was about. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. God tells us to pursue justice. But notice what, uh, what the implication, what Jesus is suggesting here. He is suggesting that we pursue justice diligently every day. And I myself know what that is like. When I learned about some of the family issues that I could not believe occurred over years of some of my relatives, I pursued justice diligently. What Jesus suggested here is to pursue justice diligently by what? by entrusting justice. That when we are seriously offended or if a loved one had a serious injustice committed towards them, an evil towards them, that as we pursue justice, we entrust justice. In who? 
in the God of justice. The God who hears the people that cry to him day and night. He will not delay long over them. He will give justice to his people. This is how gentleness tempers our anger. God's gentleness transforms how we respond in anger to injustice, and it transforms how we respond to small, minor irritants of our day. As you begin to discover for yourself and convict yourself, of the depth of God's gentleness, I hope that you too will be transformed, that you will be changed, that the next time you come across a small minor irritant, that you will conform and bow to the gentleness of God. And that also when you're considering maybe past serious offenses that have been committed against you, that your gentleness, that God's gentleness teach you how to entrust the work of justice to the ultimate worker of justice, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that that will be true for you today and throughout the rest of your life. Let us pray together. Lord, I wanna thank you for your gentleness. I cannot imagine what a God without gentleness would be like. Maybe it would be like me but you are not like me. Although you are a God of anger, your anger is tempered by your gentleness. You love what is good and you hate what is evil. Help us to respond in that same way. But those of us who struggle with gentleness learn how to temper our anger by changing what we love, to reconsider what our love really looks like, to conform it, to the things that you love so that we would be angered by them. We ask that you help us day to day to practice gentleness in tempering our anger, to start off small and minor irritants and we pray that you will bless us with the cumulative effects of that kind of practice so that when we are offended mightily by real sins and grievances, that even then we would be able to exercise gentleness in our anger towards our offenders. Well, we know that this will be true. We pray in faith that you will, in your gentleness, transform who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.